Welcome to Seeking Alpha CEO Interviews. Quality of leadership is a decisive factor in stock performance, so we provide in-depth interviews with the best and brightest CEOs in the public markets. We publish limited excerpts from our interviews on social media platforms and the full interviews at SeekingAlpha.com and in the highly rated Seeking Alpha mobile app. To find the full interviews, open SeekingAlpha.com or the Seeking Alpha mobile app and search for the phrase CEO interviews or simply type a stock ticker into the search box. Hi, and uh, welcome to Seeking Alpha CEO interviews. Um, my name is Josh Feynman, and my guest today is Ben Wolf, who is the CEO of Sarcos, a, uh, a robotics firm. Um, ben, can you just explain to the, uh, the Seeking Alpha listeners uh, what uh, Sarcos does exactly? You bet. Thanks for having me today, Josh. Um, so Sarcos is a robotics company that is focused on producing industrial grade robots that augment human workers instead of replace them. So think of full body wearable robotic exoskeletons and remote controlled robots that are intended to create the economic efficiencies of automation, but for all of those jobs that can't be automated. So think of construction workers, think of certain types of manufacturing environments, uh, think of logistics applications where the job or the task is not repetitive in nature. We think for repetitive tasks, automation is great, but for the hundreds of millions of people around the world that are engaged in jobs that are not repetitive, our robots are intended to make them more productive and safer in the jobs. Gotcha. Just a little bit more uh, background. Basically, uh, Sarcos announced a few months back that it's going to go public through a, uh, a blank check company, a SPAC deal with uh, Rotor acquisition. Um, ben, can you just give us uh, an update on where that uh, transaction uh, stands at this point? You bet. So as you point out, we announced the merger uh, a bit ago. Uh, we said that we are focused on closing the transaction in the third quarter. Uh, and we got our first draft of the proxy filed. So I think everything is uh, on track to still try and get the transaction completed in the third quarter. Gotcha. What um, would you say are, uh, you're targeting a few different uh, markets. Uh, explain which markets you're targeting and uh, you know, how, how you're attacking them. Yeah, uh, so as I mentioned, you know, our products are relevant without any customization required across a broad range of industries. So some of the most obvious places that we're focused on are the construction industry, uh, automobile manufacturing, ship manufacturing, uh, warehousing and logistics, so e-commerce warehouse companies, uh, repair and maintenance uh, associated with the power industry. Uh, and then I'd also point out the military, which is a key customer of ours as well. What, um, one of the things I found interesting is one of your products uh, is the one, the, the one that can uh, carry, a th uh, I think it's a thousand pounds, and um, one of the uses maybe down the road is um, like, uh, you know, disarming a, uh, the, the, plant, the Fukushima plant or a, a nuclear plant. Explain, explain that particular product and, and where you see that in, in the company. Yeah, so our primary focus from a technology perspective is robots that have human-like dexterity. So think of a two-armed robot with end effectors or hands on it, if you will, that can perform tasks with the same kind of agility and finesse that humans can, but while being able to lift significantly more and manipulate significantly more weight. So the amount of weight range for our products, depending on the product ranges from up to 200 pounds in lifting capability, all the way up to our biggest robot that can lift a thousand pounds. And because it has human-like dexterity, it can use tools like human hand tools. Uh, it can assemble things in its two hands. It can do a wide range of tasks like humans do them, just with superhuman strength. Gotcha. Uh, sorry, I'm sort of shifting all over the place. Um, with the SPAC, some of the sponsors uh, included uh, BlackRock and Palantir, um, Caterpillar, uh, Schlumberger. Uh, can you explain, you know, how they came to be and, you know, uh, why they are, uh, what they see in, in Sarcos? 
Sure, let me start with the strategic investors. So if you take a look at Caterpillar and Schlumberger, they have been investors in our uh, company for a number of years and they have participated in every round of financing that we have done as a private company. So they're simply participating again in our next round of financing through the pipe. Uh, other historical strategic investors have included Delta Airlines, Microsoft, um, uh, a, a handful of others. So we've had great participation from companies that expect to be customers of our products. Uh, when you talk about financial investors, BlackRock did lead our pipe investment round. Uh, and I think that, you know, it's fair to say that they were very focused on the opportunity to get the economic benefits of automation for unstructured and dynamic environments. Uh, and we stand alone uh, in the world in terms of being able to deliver those kinds of highly dexterous mobile robots that can do these non-routinized tasks. I know when we spoke before, I thought uh, it's particularly interesting today. Um, you were, we, I think we were talking about BlackRock and maybe also I'm going to mention that Palantir as an investor, but I think we were talking about BlackRock and you maybe seeing it uh, as part of their ESG effort. And, you know, with this Exxon news with these guys getting the board seats, um, I found it particularly interesting. Explain the ESG aspect of BlackRock investing in circles. Sure, and I, I won't specific, specifically reference uh, BlackRock's intentions or motivations, but if you just look at the ESG space generally, you know, the S stands for social. Uh, and there's a significant element of that that talks about how companies are dealing with their employees uh, and democratization of the workforce, workforce opportunities, longevity of workers, and keeping workers safe. Uh, and that's really a hallmark of our whole product focus. Uh, our whole focus is on delivering machines that create more job opportunities for people, not fewer, that open the aperture on the kinds of people that are qualified to be able to do physically demanding work. So perhaps some of the jobs that were relevant to you historically had to be built like a, you know, a college football linebacker to be able to do the job. And now we can take people of all shapes and sizes and ages to be able to do those jobs. So there are more people that are qualified to do these jobs. And finally, some of these physically demanding jobs, you know, they take a significant toll on the human body. And as a result, across industries, you can see that some people can only do these jobs for a handful of years before their bodies are kind of beaten up from just the normal course of doing these jobs. And so our whole focus is delivering machines that allow people to work as long as they want to in their jobs, not because they have to, but because they want to. Right, right. No, definitely. Um, you know, I, I mentioned Palantir. What they're, you know, were a pretty high company. What do you think their um, reason, rationale is for the, uh, the Sarcos investment? So our whole business model is built around a robot as a service model where we're delivering our machines as a service to our customers, effectively as a next generation unit of labor to augment their workforce. If you think about what it involves for us to be able to deliver that kind of service, we have to be able to monitor the data and evaluate the data coming off of the machine so we can ensure that they're operating as expected. So that produces a ton of data that we need to be able to analyze, collate, and, and do something material with. And when you think about what Palantir's core competencies are with their software systems, we think it's going to be a very good marriage for their systems to really be the back end of what we're doing with our robot as a service model. So we see, uh, we see a lot of potential uh, for us to work together and we're in the early stages of exploring what that can look like. Gotcha. You know, uh, Amazon recently announced, uh, I read uh, about, you know, uh, I think a fully automated plant. Um, uh, you know, that's one of the, the areas you're looking into. I mean, not full automation, but, you know, obviously helping people uh, lift. Uh, how do you see, you know, the logistics and the Amazons, the Walmarts, you know, these people that need the, the uh, help at their factories? Yeah, I think when, where we look at ourselves fitting in the ecosystem is we are supplemental to automation systems. So all of the jobs that are highly routinized or repeatable will be automated over the coming years. We are confident in that. But there's a lot that happens around the periphery of these businesses, whether it's truck loading and unloading, palletizing, depalletizing, a wide variety of different types of products or a high number of SKUs that might all be on the same pallet. That's where there's a lot of diversity or dynamicism in the task. 
And so where we really shine is by bringing mach machines to bear that can help augment humans where human decision making is still required. And uh, you know, we, we look at the TAM in our business across all of these industries, there are more than 16 million people involved in jobs on a daily basis in this country alone that are doing jobs that we think are not going to be automated anytime soon. That number gets you know, north of 100 million people if you look at it on a global basis. Uh, so it's a massive opportunity and very, very few robotics companies are looking at trying to attack that particular problem. Gotcha. And when you say very few robotics companies, who do you consider um, your main competition, you know, both public and private? You know, today we don't have anybody that we see in our rearview mirror that is trying to make a full body wearable robotic exoskeleton like ours. So we think we, we think we are in a class of our own when it comes to that. And when it comes to the teleoperated version, which is basically the upper body of the exoskeleton with the arms and the shoulders and the wrists and the hands mounted on different types of mobile bases, Again, we don't see anybody that is coming up with a highly dexterous mobile platform like we are. So while we admire and respect a lot of robotics companies that are out there in the world, we don't see anybody that is trying to bring the same kind of product as ours to market. Gotcha. Um, I know when we talked you know, previously, we, we, the only one, I mean, that's sort of similar um, was, was Berkshire Gray, which is another robotics that you know, announced us back a few months before you guys. Uh, and, you know, with a different evaluation, and we talked about that. Explain why you think there's a, the value, you know, you guys, uh, the valuation gap and the difference between, between you guys and Berkshire Gray. Yeah, so first of all, from a product perspective, you know, Berkshire, Berkshire Gray is very focused on automation of warehouses, moving products or items in a warehouse from one place to another, and I think they do a great job at that. Uh, we're not focused on automation at all. We're focused on those jobs that still require human interaction and intelligence, wisdom, judgment, decision making. So we don't see them as a competitor at all. Uh, between them and us, though, we're really, I think, two of the only um, uh, pure play robotics companies that are going to be publicly traded. Uh, so it's, you know, both companies are worth uh, investors taking a look at, uh, obviously very different business models and products. Uh, we think that we have a lower valuation on a multiples basis today than they do because they're a little ahead of us from a product launch perspective. Um, they've got uh, revenue being generated today from their core products. Uh, they've got some committed customers and we're a little bit behind them in terms of the commercialization, launch of the products and getting firm customer commitments. Uh, but you, know, they're, 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 you can obviously take a look at the disparity in the valuation multiples and see that as we hit our milestones, there's an awful lot of opportunity for value exp for uh, multiple expansion for our business. Right, right. Just a little on the timing. I think the XO you said you want to get, I think I want to say that by the middle of next year, uh, you know, delivering uh, out there. Just talk about the timetable. Is that correct? What are, we, what are, what are you thinking exactly? Yeah, so on the exoskeleton, we have put our alpha units out in the field for initial customer testing. We're taking the feedback from those alpha units and we're now developing our beta units. We expect to have beta units in the field by the end of this year with our customers. And then we'll take the final learnings from the beta version deployments and start low rate initial commercial production towards the end of next summer. Uh, with that low rate initial commercial production, we'll start shipping product in the latter half of next year uh, and start generating revenues. Gotcha. So for an investor, you know, who's interested uh, down, you know, now down the road, when should they look, I mean, uh, to, you know, you guys, I imagine you'll be press releasing, you know, if you get certain customers or certain orders, or I'm not sure if you go into that specifics like that, but how should they look at catalysts like that? What should they be looking for? I think there's really two, two different forms of catalysts to, to look for. Number one uh, is how we're doing on the commercialization of the products. Uh, are we hitting the timeline that I just referenced with our beta units and with our low rate initial production and commercial launch? Uh, so that's something to keep an eye on. And the second thing to keep an eye on is just what you said, how we're doing with customers. Uh, we've obviously announced some historical uh, customer contracts and partnerships uh, between the military and engagement with some of our commercial customers. Look for us to continue to hit some of those kinds of milestones. Gotcha. I know you guys, you know, date your history with the military back to the start of the company, I think in the, to 2000 with the DARPA, con, DARPA contract. Um, how do you see the military uh, fitting into, uh, you know, what are they, what are they going to be using it for? And are, are there pretty serious, you know, talks going on? So the military, as you point out, has been a great supporter of ours over the years, over the last two plus decades. 
Uh, we have announced uh, over the last year or, or more that we have contracts with the Air Force, uh, with the Marine Corps, with Special Operations Command and others. Uh, they have been great supporters. Now in our revenue projections, we have not included any revenues from the US military because we understand that, that DOD funding comes from Congress and Congress is all about politics. Uh, so we don't want to bank, bank on revenues from DOD for our success but we think that there is going to be significant interest from the military as we go forward. And so we see that as upside in our business. In terms of what they're looking at using the machines for, you know, it's the same kind of applications and use cases that our commercial customers have. So nothing we do is on the tactical side. You know, this is not about war fighters at the front lines. This is really about logistics. Um, many people may not realize that for every one war fighter that our country puts out there, we have a tail of logistics support that can range six or seven for every, six or seven people for every one person on the front that's a war fighter. So we move a lot of stuff. We manipulate a lot of stuff in the military. We have logistics, we have repair, maintenance, manufacturing, the list goes on. Uh, oftentimes it is not as structured an environment as you see on the commercial side, which is really where we shine. So we see the same kind of use cases for the military as we see for our commercial customers. Gotcha. Um, just a little bit back to the SPAC. I mean, SPAC, you know, gosh, three, four, five months ago was, was the hottest thing now. It's a bit of a four letter word, I, I feel like. Um, how has that uh, impacted you guys at all? Is it slowing things down? I know there's maybe a little bit more paperwork with this warrant issues that some people are seeing, but has it slowed down? I mean, uh, you know, how is that process going as far as, you know, dealing with SPAC? Yeah, so we did uh, delay our filing of our first draft of the proxy because of the warrant issue uh, that you described. That's obviously something that every SPAC had to deal with, which was looking at how, what the accounting treatment is for the warrants that were issued by the SPAC at the time that they did their public offering. That's not something that's specific or unique to Sarcos. It's relative to all of these SPACs. But we got through that process and we got the proxy filed. Um, and so at this point, we're in the wait and see mode for the first draft of SEC or first round of SEC comments. Uh, but we, when we announced the deal, we said that we expected to close in the third quarter and we're still on track for that. Gotcha. Gotcha. What, um, you know, uh, I think we're trailing to, towards the end of this. Uh, what do you think that, you know, you guys have been, uh, you know, this was announced a few months ago. Um, what, is there anything investors are missing here or, you know, what, what, uh, what, what do you need to, uh, to really say to investors that maybe they don't understand at this point? You know, I think back to your valuation comment and when investors might want to think about getting invested. Uh, you know, I think that they, that, that investors should focus on uh, what are the near-term deliverables and milestones for us. Uh, if they have questions about our risks in the business, which we've gone to at great lengths to discuss in our proxy, uh, in our proxy statement, uh, think about what it is that we will do to uh, increase the valuation and expand the multiple as we start showing progress in the business. And I think that, um, you know, certainly from my perspective, it's a great time to invest. That's why I personally invested in the pipe, uh, as I have in most of our investment rounds. Uh, it, it is something where I, I would say, as we make progress and de-risk the business, both from a product perspective and from a market acceptance perspective, um, you know, there's great opportunity to create shareholder value here. And so I would encourage people to take a look at it now, uh, read through all the public materials as they come available uh, and, and really try and dig in and understand the market opportunity. It is rare from my perspective to see this kind of a company with a market opportunity as large as ours is with very limited competition. Right, yep. Um... Man, I think that uh, about wraps it up. I appreciate the time. Um, and um, thanks for uh, joining the uh, Seeking Alpha CEO interview. Great. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate you having me. Thanks.